Hi, everyone. Welcome to our latest KinderCast episode. I'm Arya Borkoff, the CEO and founder of Lion Tree, actually celebrating uh, Lion Tree's birthday today. Um, I'm honored to be sitting here virtually, of course, as we are all still in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic with Professor Jeffrey West of the Santa Fe Institute, theoretical physicist, complexity scientist, author, and speaker. Um, in 2017, Professor West released the book Scale, The Universal Laws of Growth, Innovation, Sustainability, and the Pace of Life in Organisms, Cities, Economies, which is both a memoir and an odyssey. Now, this is a book I've actually recommended in, on many occasions, including on this podcast and in private settings. It's meant a lot to me. Uh, Jeffrey, it's a pleasure to host you today. Thank you for being here. Um, your, your book must be getting a lot of, a lot of attention these days, given not only the pandemic and the way we live life uh, as it evolves, uh, but also the drastic changes to human behavior around the world. Uh, how have you been? How have you been spending these past few months? And I hope that you and your family are healthy. Yes, well, first of all, thank you, Ari, for uh, inviting me to be on your podcast. I'm delighted and flattered, and uh, I look forward to our conversation. And thank you also for giving a big promo to my book. <laughs> uh, so, uh, indeed, yes, so... Uh, the book, when it came out, it did much better than I thought. It was, uh, you know, I wasn't too sure who, quite who the audience would be, but it did very well. But it then, uh, during when the pandemic came, um, it did, it, uh, or it got a big boost. Um, and uh, lots of people have been in touch with me uh, pr because, of course, it, it, it was trying to give a kind of very big picture, 100,000 foot look at the world around us from the biological, ecological to the socioeconomic and to see that it's actually an integrated whole and uh, ways of thinking about it that might prove useful for a framework for dealing with whatever the problems are. And here happens to be one of an extraordinary magnitude and quite unique. And indeed, in answer to your question, of course, it's, it got me to, um, uh, I, I was going to say rethink, but to, to just meditate on some of the issues and how it relates to some of the ideas that I had developed. And, uh, and, and one of the first things I did, by the way, in terms of what did I do, is um, I decided, uh, you know, one way to learn things, of course, is you read about them and you study them, but also you sort of re-derive them for yourself in your own language. And so I decided... I would sort of re-derive in my own language and within the context of the ideas that I developed in that book, um, epidemiology. I mean, that is how do dis dis um, pandemics or how do viruses spread? And, and of course, maybe we'll get into this, it ain't so different than the way ideas spread. Mm. You know, I mean, it's the same, the, the, the underlying sort of mathematics and dynamics are not so similar. Maybe we'll get into that. But anyway, that was one of the things I did, and that was very helpful and insightful in terms of uh, reacting to what was happening around us. I obviously prefer to have ideas spreading than viruses spreading. Absolutely. And uh, uh, yes, it's, and, and it's sort of interesting because um, I realized that... Uh, you know, the, the, the people that were in a virus, in a pandemic, the, the thing that you want to promote is the number of people who recover, who overcome the virus. And in ideas, you have exactly the opposite. You want to diminish the people that are rejecting the virus, namely the idea. You want to. <laughs> so it's right. sort of interesting, actually, even though the sort of underlying dynamic is the same because it's transmission between people, but the end result, you want to be different. You want, for a virus, you want everybody to reject it, but if you're a promoter of an idea, you want everybody to accept it. <laughs> That's right, exactly. The, uh, so we're going to talk about, th we, we could talk about a number of things, but just to give our audience a sense of the organization of our discussion uh, and what to look forward to, because I'm really excited about what we're going to discuss and this is why I've, I've uh, uh, requested uh, your presence here and obviously I'm really grateful for your accepting it um, is one is you know how how human behavior is going to change uh, with this now COVID-19 and the onset of 
possibilities of viruses today and into the future and how that changes behavior. Everyone talk, talks about, are we going back to normal? Are we going to change things for the future? Is anything going to happen differently? That's the first topic. And the, the second topic is uh, near and dear to my heart. And a lot of people uh, are thinking about this is what, how does the city change? You know, we're connected. Uh, we're working from home. Um, do we work from remote spaces for the rest of our lives? And therefore, the city's uh, diminish in importance for the first time um, in, in our history. And you have great statistics that I'd love to get into about you know, how cities have evolved and, uh, and its importance and will evolve. And the third topic is really about um, the, uh, the lifespan of different species and why one species will last for minutes and others could last a lifetime and how companies kind of try to achieve that durability and that scale. And we often talk in merger parlance of needing scale to be successful. And there's economic, um, you know, solves for that and, and supports for that. But really what is scale and, and, and what is sustainability of that scale and how do you achieve it? So th that, if that's okay, that's a lot to digest, but that's the organization of our talk if that's okay. Oh yeah, absolutely. They're all questions dear to my heart and ones that I have thought about that I, I can't say I'm going to be able to supply definitive answers, but I hope that we can uh, uh, stimulate an interesting discussion that uh, stimulates people that maybe are listening to this, do listen to this, to think um, in a slightly different way about some of these issues, actually. Great, um, and great. by the way, the, the first two, of course, are closely connected. What are going to be the residue, so to speak, of this extraordinary event? And uh, one of them will be its course, it's uh, uh, long-term effects or potential long-term effects anyway on cities and urbanization and all the rest of that stuff. Yeah. So, well, why don't, why, don't we, uh, why don't we start there, actually? Um, so you, I would love to go through some of your statistics about, you know, where cities have come from in the 1800s to right. your projections into the you know, 2050 and, 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 and all that. But your point in the book is really that um, while – you know, companies have a finite lifespan and, you know, organisms have a finite lifespan and humans have a finite lifespan. Cities seem to go on forever. And even nuclear bombs that have unfortunately hit cities around the world have, have not uh, closed them down. But now we're dealing with this uh, onset of connectivity that is the silver lining of the whole pandemic that we can work from many places given the quality of the broadband networks, not only in the U.S. but around the world. Uh, which would be unthinkable, you know, even a few years ago. And therefore, people are now also nervous about being in dense areas because viruses can spread. Now, maybe there's immunity as a result of that or other things that have a silver lining as well. But how do you think about, uh, is it safe to be back in Manhattan in the future or is that a thing of the past? Well, I don't think it's a thing of the past, but of course, these are obviously, whatever we discuss here is speculative because it depends on you know, all kinds of things over which we have very little control. One of which, one crucial one, obviously, is whether um, we can uh, develop a, 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 a serious vaccine um, that can uh, make most of us immune from it. Um, and whether how this thing itself evolves, obviously, I mean, it's going to mutate uh, just like the influenza does. Um, or so you know, maybe our best hope is that it becomes, as people have said, just like the flu, namely, it's with us forever, which is very likely. Um, and that, um, on the other hand, the vast majority of people um, will, even though they may get sick, will not die from it. And we just have to accept that a small number will die. Um, that may be the best we can hope for. It could, but, uh, you know, even with vaccines, uh, and in that situation, obviously, um, a Manhattan will thrive again. Um, now, uh, backing off a little bit, um, we have to understand what a city is uh, in order to answer that question truly. And, uh, you know, one of the things that um, is often forgotten about a city, you know, when you said the word Manhattan, immediately in my head springs up, you know, the tall skyscrapers and the excitement of New York and Times Square and going down to the village and, you know, but, but very much the physicality. And that's what we think of usually when we think of cities and that's what they are. But what we often do not appreciate is that that is just the stage. I mean, it's a facilitator, an enabler of 
bringing us together. The whole point of a city, and it's really is truly, in some ways, our greatest invention. It's a machine that we developed in order to in facilitate um, social interaction, in order to create wealth, to create ideas, to innovate, um, and to thereby increasing the quality and standard of living, hopefully across the globe. I mean, that's sort of the, what, what the city has evolved to be. And so we need to see the city actually primarily as um, the machine to enable uh, social networking. Uh, and it's the nature of social networks. And it is the increased connectivity in social networks that makes cities great. New York is a great city, actually, uh, not because it looks, you know, has a certain beauty and a certain, but, but, but what it does, it facilitates extraordinary interactions so that it, uh, you know, it's an exciting place to be. It has greater job opportunity, a greater kind of sexiness and buzziness and so on that uh, with all due respect, Des Moines, Iowa does not have. Um, and, um, and so, and, and that um, intensity increases with city size. Um, size plays a crucial role in this. Now, that's great, but there's this dark side. And the dark side is coming along with that is of course, um, increased crime, um, increased um, uh, pollution, uh, and also increased transmission of disease because the, the facilitating is to increase the exchange of information basically between people in order to create ideas and wealth. And so uh, going along with that necessarily is uh, the transmission of viruses and bacteria, social attitudes, negative social attitudes, that is, so crime increases, disease increases, and so on. So, um, and that's the, the, the kind of paradox that we're in now, because, um, and we see that, it's obvious, it's obvious in front of our eyes, in order to um, uh, mitigate the effects of the pandemic, we have to decrease social connectivity. But in decreasing so social connectivity, we're fighting against what the city is and what the city is doing and in so doing, we necessarily decrease socioeconomic activity. And indeed, if you sort of carried that on forever, I think it is, uh, it, it's not clear a city in the present form could survive. You, you have an alternative scenario of connectivity to these days, which is virtual connectivity. No, that's, a, that's now a very fascinating question as we look into the future. And one of the things also we have to recognize is that major transitions whether they be uh, you know, something as major as the Industrial Revolution or um, uh, a war, the Second World War, um, or um, a financial collapse, um, acts as an accelerator. It does many things, but it acts as an accelerator. That is, it, it obviously produces new things, but those things are actually already there, but they were in some incipient form. It's not like suddenly something happened because of the war, it did, but there's something that happened was acceleration. What may well happen and very likely will happen is the use of what we're doing. We're here, we are talking on Zoom and there's gonna be many more of these, obviously it's, it's keeping the, the system alive at the moment, but even when we, whatever we return to, even if we return to the position we were in before, this is gonna become a highly dominant mode of interaction. Um, if we needed to meet to discuss some something, an event, a business transaction, well, you know, maybe in the past I would have flown to New York and spent a day and wasted three days, in quotes. Now we, you know, we could have done this, but we didn't, it didn't feel quite right. Now we're going to be doing this and we're going to have meetings this way. We all know that. And the huge question is, look, we have the extraordinary world we live in today because the city has engendered these social interactions which produced Microsoft, which produced Google, which produced the theory of relativity, it produced quantum mechanics, it produced the theory of evolution. That's what cities did by bringing this, this, this ferment together. Now we're going from that sort of four-dimensional world, you know, the 
which is real and visceral to this soul, I mean, I hate to say this, relatively soulless way of interaction. You're two dimensional, you're on this stupid screen in front of me. Um, you know, we, it's, it's, it, I, I, I don't really feel you. I don't, you know, I hate to use this, but I don't smell you. I don't sort of see yeah. the nuances. And we don't know just how much that plays. We feel it. I mean, I, the thing I'm suffering from at home, being home for these months, is I've enjoyed it immensely, actually. But I have missed getting together with some of my colleagues and collaborators in a small room in front of a blackboard, bullshitting away, going back and forth, writing on, you know, the stuff of life. And yeah. the question is, can this in any sense replace it? And to what extent will it? It will do some of it. Um, and it will be there. And as it will be what you already uh, alluded to, obviously, um, we're going to do much more remote work. I mean, we're going to, many of us will remain at home working. Um, and um, many of us will live very far distant from what used to be called our office or our headquarters. Yeah. And well, that will happen. Isn't it, isn't it really about how much risk you want to take for the joys of life? Because you mentioned Des Moines, Iowa could be a perfectly safe place to live, yeah. not nearly no. as exciting generalizing here and instead you live in let's say uh, New York City as an example and say I'll take some of the risk for that increased energy and obviously sure. I'll bring in some remote working but it's not going to solve all of my desires sure. but over but in your research you know in the past you've made the case that in spite of any pitfalls the cities have seen it can it constantly is adaptable and it constantly changes constantly moves forward and it's almost like Maybe there are a few examples, like in the 1950s with a suburban wave. But by and large, it's almost like a linear move of more and more population densities coming to the city. Do you think that still continues? Yes, I do. Because I think now, and this is, again, speculation, I think it's almost in our DNA now that we need physical connectivity as part of social connectivity. Um, you know, people continue to be drawn to cities. Um, the, uh, that's where the activity is. That's where the opportunities are. And a large part of it is because of that visceral feeling of connection. Um, and so um, despite all of the um, um, portents of doom for the future of cities that have come in the past, um, and, and by the way, I've been working and thinking about cities for uh, since um, the mid 2000s, about 2005, as I turned my attention to cities. And after this work, I and, and especially after writing the book, I got a lot of interviews and podcasting. But a standard question, always, even before this, was the future of cities and people leaving the cities, not needing to work. In. And I, I said, first of all, the statistics. The statistics are that's a very small number and it's usually the rich. I mean, it's those that can afford it. The vast majority of people can't, of course. Um, that's the first thing. And secondly, all the evidence points in the other direction. Um, you know, you live, you're in New York, presumably. Yes. But you could, I mean, you could have decided several years ago, actually, presumably, to live, um, I don't know, um, in the Adirondacks or... Uh, you know, go to live in Boulder, Colorado or somewhere, but somewhere that, you know, still run your company. Um, but, um, and indeed, Silicon Valley is a, just a fantastic example because, you know, it, it, got, it was founded in Mountain View in the uh, boring, you know, suburbs of uh, the Bay Area. Uh, it couldn't have been a more boring place. And, uh, and that's, Silicon that's Valley... Where I'm, that's where I'm from originally. I was born yeah, in Palo Alto. No, from Palo Alto. I spent years at Stanford, lived in Palo Alto. The first apartment I ever had back in 1964 or 5 was Mountain View. <laughs> <laughs> so I speak from... <laughs> I, it wasn't just bullshit. It's I lived there, damn it, for a, well, just for a year. But I lived in Palo Alto, which is also boring, by the way. I mean, relatively speaking, it's a lovely place, of course. And Stanford's a good university, but nevertheless, 
it grew up in Mountain View as a, to some extent, a spin-off from Stanford. Um, but as you well know, you know, more and more, these people have begun to realize that Mountain View is boring and maybe we should live in San Francisco. And there's been this, you know, migration into the city, whereas they could have all decided, why aren't we living at Lake Tahoe? Why don't we all move to Lake Tahoe? We don't even have to be near each other. But they don't. They go to San Francisco and they're destroying the city. I mean, in quotes, I mean, they're changing the city. But right. so, it's, it's interesting because you say um, you could have made this decision or you made the reference to me. I could have made a decision to leave the city prior to the COVID pandemic. Yes. Uh, even with connectivity, I chose not to. So maybe the only real uh, determining factor is risk tolerance. Because yes. if people leave now, it's just because of fear and risk tolerance. Absolutely. And eventually that abates somewhat of the sides and the normal trends yes. continue. So there will be this acceleration of such things for a while. Now, the big question is, um, people have very short memories. You know, I mean, in, in a year or two years, people, and probably within a year even, people will be saying, well, it actually wasn't so bad. You know, it's not terrible. Um, you know, it, it wasn't, it, it, it sounded terrible. They over-exaggerated all of this stuff. Um, so, you know, we'll go live in New York or we'll go live in um, Chicago. You know, it's, uh, you know, they've exaggerated both the, the pandemic and all the racial inequality and all this. And so, you know, it's not, so that will happen too. So there are these, obviously these two forces, the centrifugal force, to people escaping, but there's also, which is, I believe, dominant, the central petal force bringing people back in because cities have been this extraordinary engine of creativity in general, whatever it is. From Yeah, from I also feel like um, we always talk about the financial markets being efficient, but I also found yeah. the streets to be very efficient during this crisis. So the protesting and the yeah. call for unification of our people and a call for equality has happened physically on the streets, not virtually, yeah. right? No, that's what's amazing. I mean, because we were beginning, and it's true, and it's, it's, it's absolutely true, that somehow all the action is now um, on the web. I mean, it's uh, social media, which of course is playing an extraordinarily powerful role and uh, has initiated all kinds of things. However, when push comes to shove, so to speak, you know, in the Arab Spring, which was indeed started on social media or is engendered in social media, and the latest stuff to do with the pandemic, in particular, uh, Black Lives Matter and so on, and the police. Um, that, of course, was initiated to some extent on the web, but the actuality of it and the thing that really got us and that is changing things is people going on the streets. And, and one of the things that is not appreciated when thinking about cities is that, you know, you have this image of the social media or the web, and it's very virtual. I mean, the idea of the cloud, it's all up there, associated from, you know, the real, it's like heaven. I mean, it's sort of not really connected to, to the earth. But of course, it, when you're on social media or, do, or, or on your iPhone or doing Facebook, whatever it is, you have to be someplace. You have to be somewhere. You know, you have to be you're like you are. You're sitting in, I know, your living room. I'm sitting in the library I have in the house. Um, uh, and, and, but, but, but because of that, you have to be connected to the city because you've got to get food. You have your kids to educate. You have, you know, so you're integral to the city, even if you are participating in this virtual world. So you're never free of it. So... And that is the extraordinary thing about a city. It is this um, amazing integration between its physicality, place, and the kind of ephemeral exchange of information. And it integrates those. And even before, nothing to do with the web or anything. This is before, because we, all, we had to talk to one another. That's the whole point. We have to interact with each other. And, uh, and we have to do it somewhere. So it sounds sort of obvious, but that is the essence of what a city is. Yeah, and you, you uh, I think I've always said it's very important to check our own biases in the subconscious when we make predictions 
in the height of fear in a pandemic yes. working from home to say that's going to be the new normal. Yes. You have to o- almost account for that bias back to yes. a median way of thinking about things, right? No, so if you look at cities, you know, I mean, one of the things that uh, we haven't talked about is the science behind this. Because if you take those ideas that I just um, articulated, then um, it's all to do with networks, both the networks of the city, the physical networks, transport networks, and uh, tra- um, uh, supply networks, but also the social networks. And, and it's the mathematics and physics of those that gives rise amazingly to regular behavior underlying the apparent chaos and arbit- what seems arbitrariness that goes on around us, but actually underlying it are very general laws. They're sort of coarse-grained, meaning they're not precise, but they give approximations to what is happening where we can understand and predict various things. And, um, you know, that's, that's an integral part of who we are. And because of that, uh, the nature of those networks, there is built into the system uh, uh, two crucial things. One is a certain kind of robustness, which means that even when you perturb the system, these forces that are giving rise to these laws are at work pushing you back. <laughs> and the other is that what seems counter to that adaptability, the crucial yeah. aspect of adaptability. And cities, like organisms, are extraordinarily adaptable. And the, the thing that's amazing about cities, they're adaptable over very short time spans. Um, you know, and, and that's why they're still here. They still go on. I mean, you mentioned uh, earlier that um, uh, one of the things that really struck me when I started thinking about that was this, in fact, it, my whole work on this in terms of the cities and companies started with this sort of observation one day, I realized how amazing it was that cities seem to stay forever. I mean, hundreds of years anyway, maybe thousands. But companies, to my amazement, which I didn't really understand, usually die very quickly. I mean, very few companies last very long. Um, In fact, when we did an analysis, when I actually got into the work, we discovered that the expected lifetime of a publicly traded company, one that's already on the stock market and thinks it's thriving, is about 10 years. So, you know, if you last more than 10 years, you're doing pretty damn well. So, it's, so companies are incredibly fragile and cities are extraordinarily robust and they're robust because of their adaptability and companies are fragile because typically they are not adaptable. That is, adaptable. That, you, you are speaking uh, my language. This is the mantra that we've put instilling into the company through the crisis that we have to yeah. be adaptable. Life is unpredictable, so therefore it's not you know, rigid. Uh, yeah. in its uh, outcomes and you have to therefore be adaptable. And um, so tell me about like, how do, how do companies uh, beat the averages? How do the companies that are publicly no. traded well, last as long as cities? <laughs> That's hard. <laughs> because companies, um, companies are different from cities. It's, it's a fascinating question. They're both social organizations, meaning they're groups of people brought together you know, to kind of live and work together. I mean, uh, but there's a big difference, of course. One is a company has a pretty well-defined function. You know, it varies, obviously. I mean, some are, you know, only going to make pins, maybe, but others are very diverse. But nevertheless, relative to a city, and this is one of the other aspects of adaptability, cities are extraordinarily diverse. Um, and by the way, New York is the most diverse city, certainly in the United States. Diverse here means in terms of different kinds of jobs and employments, different kinds of businesses. I mean, New York is um, it's extraordinary in that sense. Maybe next to only a, maybe only next to only a city like Jerusalem, you know, with its ancient history and tons of diversity, right? Yeah, exactly. So you have diversity is crucial for also part of the viability and longevity of a city and sustainability of a city. Um, and companies have the following problem. They usually have, you know, they have a purpose. Secondly, they have to make a profit, ultimately. Um, and because of that, uh, since they have a product at the end, an explicit product, 
uh, they need to have a pretty well-defined organization and structure, which is typically top-down. Um, well, overwhelmingly, it's top-down. There are counterexamples, but overwhelmingly, they're top-down. And, um, the, you know, just to encapsulate sort of a cartoon version of life history of a company, of course, is that at the beginning, when it's small, there's lots of ideas, lots of people, lots of excitement, uh, lots of different kind of products, out that want to go out there in the marketplace and it's sort of the image of being in the back garage making a little invention and so on that kind of image and of course when when it goes out when a company goes out onto the market the market forces then of course start to determine what the successful products are so necessarily typically the product and idea space contracts in response to the market, rightly so. Yeah. And of course, what happens is, ultimately, as the company grows and becomes more and more successful, almost always, the dimensionality of the product space decreases. So it becomes from a multidimensional organization, which is what a city is, to a low-dimensional organization. And the city goes exactly the opposite. A small town is low dimensional. A New York City is super duper dimensional. And so when you have that low dimensionality, that can be fine for a long time. But unfortunately, uh, the other, another thing happens as the company grows, it needs to get a bureaucracy. It needs to have an administration. It has to obey the law. It has to pay the taxes. It has to clean the, the shop floor. It has to clean the offices, whatever. All these things have to be in place of bureaucracy. And typically, a company uh, uh, becomes a bureaucracy. Yeah. And so what happens is you have these two things. You have a lower dimensional space that you're in and you have a stranglehold of a bureaucracy almost necessarily. And that's fine if everything's going well and nothing much is changing in the external world. But if something changes in the external world, a company which seems impossible, it won't be around forever, hurts motor car, hurts, hurts rentals, goes bust. I mean, or, or TWA we lose, we lose Montgomery Wards, we lose Sears. Um, we, and, you know, eventually we will probably lose a Google and a Microsoft. Something will happen. And these companies become rigid. It's hard to rigid. So the question is put in that language, to what extent, if any, can a company mimic a city? Because a city has extraordinary adaptability because and diversity because it sort of allows anything to happen in a certain sense it has an administration it has but it is there to facilitate that's that's what i said early on it's a there to a, a great city has a mayor and administration that facilitates entrepreneurship facilitates social interaction facilitates job opportunities but it it sees that role um it doesn't see it like Mr. Trump does, for example, running the United States. That's the opposite to what you want in a city and actually what you want in a country. That's a separate issue. But um, so uh, we, we, you, you need that. And, and it's hard to run a company that way. And that's the but question. You, Can you run a company that way? Yeah. You basically say, it's very interesting because you're saying that a city has a purpose that is effectively flexible. Like it's not one rigid purpose. It's a facilitator and therefore is adaptable because the people and the diversity of the city will continuously innovate and adapt and kind of create reasons to exist that is very flexible. Whereas a company always has a rigid purpose, whether it's profits or yes. a product, and, and that the market likes that simplicity in a way because it's easy to understand and it's consistent, but the best companies can actually lose some of those purpose uh, or products and try to create more adaptability to continue to reinvent itself as long as it does so in a measured way and, and a harmonious, continuous way. Because cities are continually reinventing themselves, actually. And, uh, you know, when a city sees itself as a company, it can get into trouble. And Detroit, of course, is a famous example. When Detroit, Detroit saw itself as basically a company town for automobile production, um, you know, that was its identity. And cities do identify in that way. But Detroit is an extreme example, which was great. It was it's fantastic until, of course, other, other countries decided to make 
That's an automobile, and then you're in trouble. And it uh, wasn't able to adapt. I mean, it's because it is amazing. It's still, you know, I still look back sometimes and I think, you know, it must, it was obvious. It was obvious in the 70s, 80s, what was happening. But why couldn't they just change? <laughs> because they can't. That's the tr- it's, the, it's moving the great big battleship. You can't do it. If yeah. the other, if the, if the, because the competitors, the, the new, the new blood, the young blood are quick, fast, and smaller. And yeah. they take over. It's the same thing. I feel I'm nearly 80 years old. I'll be 80 very, very soon. And I look around me at all these young, bright, brilliant young people I work with. And I think, boy, I'm a Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> Hardly. But I feel like, um, I think the diversity of the city has also a lot to do with it because the, it's not a homogenous society. And sometimes companies can learn that from cities, whereas companies can be too homogenous. And if you have more diversity, it lends itself to more uh, texture and more innovation and more, uh, you know, room to roam, so to speak, if you have that kind of management, that kind of bureaucracy around it. Yeah. No, I, I often uh, say about cities that one of the great things about cities, and New York is a prime is the best example, actually, um, is that uh, you walk down, uh, you know, Main Fifth Avenue, even walk down the main streets of New York, and you always see crazy people. You know, I mean, there's always crazy people. In fact, I was in last time I was in New York, which was about I would say six months ago. Anyway, somewhere towards the end of last year, I was walking down Fifth Avenue, and indeed, there was a crazy guy in the middle of Fifth Avenue with barely anything on singing at the top of his voice and there were police everywhere totally ignoring him and uh, he was just singing and the traffic was going around him and i thought boy this is what makes new york a great city because it's tolerant of, of 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 extremes and what does that do that provides this extraordinary boundary it provides a kind of socio-psychological framework that anything can happen which means you know, maybe I can invent this. Maybe I can start this company. Maybe I can do whatever. And it, it somehow gets into the DNA. And, uh, and I think that's very important for a city. So that's sort of a, a weird cartoon version. I hope the crazy person in New York didn't turn to you and refer to you as Detroit. No, he did. <laughs> he did eventually come over. And I was watching him, but he came over said hi to me. <laughs> but, but, you know, but you can't allow that in a company. You know, you don't walk through the hallways of a company and see crazy loony guys. Well, in a different way you might, but not in the usual sense. Uh, not even in, the, in Google, which has this image of, you know, uh, that they're somehow free of the usual constraints. But there it's all pretty much uh, standardized anyway. So the question is, can you have the spirit of, obviously you don't want that, but what you want is the spirit of what that represents as a yes. metaphor for can you sort of have a company that has enough freedom built into it and enough flexibility that one can tolerate uh, changes within the company where it's so that it can be adaptable. I mean, yeah. for example, you know, when, when things get bad in companies, typically, so this was true in the 80s, especially, uh, the big companies... Uh, when they went through uh, minor recessions, the first thing they do is fire the R&D people. They decrease the R&D because, well, you know, we're, we're, the next couple of years it's really problematic and we'll build that back up later, which never happens. So you get rid of the innovative part and you again narrow and narrow down. Key takeaway you've given me is uh, in times of uh, crisis, um, even if you're looking for more security, the concept of leaving a city when you're actually longing for uh, connection and diversity yeah. is incongruous because you actually want to be running towards that diversity, not leaving it. But let me ask you about comp- the companies that, uh, to go to the heart of your research, the companies that have the best chance of survival or approaching in some asymptote a lifespan of a city, which obviously is an exaggeration, uh, are the ones that have uh, learned how to achieve scale, um, yeah. which is another way of being adaptable and that is like the opposite of atrophy in your research. So basically putting more calories in the system. And so how do you think about companies and needing scale to survive or to thrive? 
Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's an interesting question that one about um, uh, first of all, you know the the longest first of all just side comment the longest lived companies are ones that have that are the opposite to what we're talking about. They are ext- they're in a very very narrow niche, extremely narrow where there's only one of them so to speak. I mean, and even those are vulnerable. You know, that is, they're a, a, a brewing company that's been there since the 14th century, you know, some special beer they brew in some obscure part of Germany or some sake they produce in some obscure part of Japan. By the way, just a story on that, uh, that uh, I just happened to read that um, a company that had been in existence for many hundreds of years was something called the Westminster Bell Company. And it produced most of the great bells um, in, in, in the United Kingdom. And uh, just this year, after many hundreds of years, it went bust because people aren't building bells anymore and it doesn't know how to do anything else. I mean, it's exactly this story. It's a sort of scaled down version of Detroit. Detroit didn't know how to build anything. The great big wonder, I love those cars, by the way, just a side, I mean, against my environmental self. I love those. That was one of the things I loved when I came to America. Those big, huge cars. Oh. <laughs> no, I loved them, but I miss them. Um, uh, even though they were completely stupid. Um, uh, but um, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult... Um, you know, one of the problems for companies, one of the things... So in our research on companies... Um, we, it was very hard to get data. And um, the data we eventually got that led us to some of these conclusions is data that um, comes basically from tax returns. Um, and so therefore, it's from publicly traded companies. That's the first point to make, actually. That these are publicly traded because they're the only data you can actually get. Now, the work that we did that I was involved in on organisms and ecosystems um, and cities, uh, we have similar data sets, you know, across different companies or cities of different sizes, organisms of different sizes and their physiology, life history, and so forth. But also in terms of the theory, the underlying theory, which is due with networks and the transmission of energy resources and information, of course, in organisms, we know a lot about that. We know, I know about your, I know how your circulatory system works. I even know a little bit about how your neural system works, um, et cetera, et cetera. I know how the transport works in cities. I know about social networks. Companies can't find out what the hell goes on inside them. So we don't know what the social networks are in companies. It's hard to get that data. And here's, so... Um, we were supported brief for a while by a major corporation, I won't mention the name, um, and um, it, who got turned on to our work at the very beginnings of getting involved with cities, actually. And, um, but a company got, got turned on because they thought it might be relevant for some of their own thinking about the future of their company. So it was great. And they gave us some modest support. And in so doing... Um, we thought it would be great to use them as a case study. And we said, look, it would be great. Can we get your the social network of the company? You know, what do you mean the social network of the company? I said, well, who is talking to whom? Who, where, who are the nodes that are making the decisions? And how much are they connecting? Or, you know, what is the connectivity within the company so we can see how it works? You know, it's sort of like, I can't tell you about your personal health unless I can do figure out, you know, what's going on inside you, you know, I mean, it's so what's going on inside the company. Boy, they wouldn't get, they stalled and stalled. And then the lawyers got involved and said, no, we can't give that information out. And then we said, well, we'll scrub it. We we'll anonymize everything and blah, blah. Anyway, cut a long story short, we never got it. And the organization chart, which they did send us because we get on the web anyway, um, we could not, was useless. I mean, the organization chart tells you something, of course, but it doesn't tell you really how the company works, what the guts of the company is, what the internal dynamics is, who are the key players, and, and 
how many managers there are even, you know, I mean, it's amazing. And the flow of communication. And the flow, that's the main thing, one of the flows. So I said, look, here's what we would like. Get all your emails, get your email. You must, you obviously know your email traffic, anonymize it, and just tell us how, is, how it's all connected. So we can, we create the network for you, for example, or the telephone calls or whatever. No company has done. Now I interacted with CEOs of some major companies in the United States, and all of them are reluctant. All of them get very excited about the idea because they think that's exactly what they should be doing. They realize, <laughs> but they won't get it. And we can't get it. So one of the problems in answering your question is since we don't know what the internal structure is, um, we, uh, we can't really answer that question. Now, I'll tell you one thing we have started to do recently, this is definitely a work in progress, is we can get information on federal agencies and on universities because most of them are public and they have to post what their, you know, what, what, where their resources are going. And that's been extremely interesting. And it's led us to a question which is a peripheral question to this, but it is very important in terms of what you've asked. And that is a question to do with what is the appropriate size for the administration or bureaucracy of a company of a given size in a given sector? I mean, that is, we're always complaining. Everybody complains, including me, the fucking bureaucracy, I'm sorry, the bureaucracy <laughs> is you know, it's driving this, it's completely bureaucratic, this organization, yeah. it's impossible to get anything done. Yeah. They're always, you know, they're hopeless. But no one asks the question, what should the size, maybe it's the right size. How do we know what the size should be? And or, at different moments in time. Yes, exactly. And how should it be changing? And how does it depend upon the, the functionality of the company and the product space? And so on, you know, we ought to be able to answer those questions. So one of my disappointments is I discovered that uh, you'd think business schools would have done a lot of research on this, but there's very little. So we've been trying to do that. And we've, uh, it's been extremely interesting, actually. Um, it turns out, for example, federal bureaucracies, especially as they get bigger, completely opposite to what you think, actually get a very good economy of scale. They get less bureaucratic per, per capita and per task, the bigger they are. So that's sort of interesting of itself, you know, but we need to compare that. Right? And we have compared it to universities. They're more efficient than universities, but we need to compare it to some of the major corporations. Anyway, in order to answer this question of really, you know, what is scale for a company? Um, and um, what are the kinds of, inter, um, what are the kinds of, interferences you can do to mitigate problems that are going to occur and yeah. especially how can we position it that structure forget about even the culture to be adaptable you know is there something we can see in this that can we can learn from biology or from cities in terms of its internal structure now that leads it leads them to be adaptable and at the same time, robust. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because scale could be defined as uh, scale geographically. It could be defined yeah. as scale in a concentrated product uh, set, or it could be a scale defined as more diversity uh, yeah. of product and, or other things as well that I'm, that I'm not mentioning. And I think if you, I mean, this is just me, I'm obviously a novice compared to your, your expertise here, but um, if you could replicate the city dynamic of, the people being adaptable and constantly dynamic in a company setting where you have obviously administration and bureaucracy, but you yield to ultimately the functionality of the people to drive a constant, uh, you know, kind of moving target of the next goal, the next product, then you may be able to achieve more longevity um, yeah. if it's truly in the culture of the system versus autocratic and from the top. Yeah. No, no, there's uh, there are two points I want to emphasize. One I've already said is that, um, you know, since there's a, f a fundamental difference in character between companies and cities, you'll never reproduce this, you know, you won't have this, you'll never better reproduce that dynamic in a company. Um, uh, but you can approximate it. 
Um, you know, and, the, and then it brings up the question of what is the company for? I mean, why, why do we, you know, <laughs> well, we know traditionally what a company is for. It is, you know, it's an incredibly efficient way of, so to speak, getting goods to market, I mean, roughly speaking. Um, and it's a marvelous invention, uh, just like cities uh, were. Um, but, um, you know, uh, a company is, is, a, is, a, is a kind of abstract thing of itself. It's made of people. And in a way, you know, it doesn't matter if it dies. Maybe it's good it dies. And, you know, so it releases that pent up energy, which is in the high, that structure to do other things, you know, more innovative things, just as it is that it's good that I'm going to die. And I hate to say you're going to die because, you know, you're, that's part of Darwinian evolution. And I, and, you know, that's, that's the way the world is. And, and companies are like that because they are like us. They are in a competitive market um, as we are in a certain sense. Um, so we have to keep that in mind. And so, uh, and the other thing is the nature of the company may be changing. And I sense that a little bit in terms of this whole question of social responsibility. That is the kind of tradition uh, kind of this 19th century capitalist image of the hard-nosed, you know, profits at any cost and screw the workers, uh, which maybe uh, probably did exist to some extent, but um, there certainly were philanthropic and uh, uh, leaders of companies in the 19th century. But um, there wasn't the same sense of responsibility all the way through the 19th and 20th centuries that we're beginning to see, and we're, we're beginning to see in the 20th century, it became social responsibility after the founder or the CEO of the company retired. Then they became philanthropic. But mm -hmm. during the lifetime of the company, it was still thought of as a profit-making machine providing goods for the people. Um, but I do sense that more and more companies are becoming of themselves so to speak, philanthropic, or at least, you know, feeling that they have a certain social responsibility beyond just making a profit for the uh, investors and so on. And well, I, I, sorry? I'll say at its heart, that is all about the company taking on a societal uh, yes. obligation or responsibility as a gathering point. Absolutely. And that brings it closer to a city, you see. Correct. Because it's bringing in a different kind of sense of purpose, a different morality and ethic that sort of was at best very secondary to at least being in the consciousness of companies. And that is what, and a city, for all its faults, whatever you, one might think of, you know, New York, the mayors of New York and so on, that is part of the ethic is, is obviously, uh, it, as I said, it was to facilitate interaction, but is to, it has a certain moral and ethical code in terms of wanting to help people, help the poor, um, as well as encourage entrepreneurship. So, um, and companies um, are more and more, uh, as I see it anyway, beginning, uh, it's beginning to enter into their consciousness. And I think that's a very positive outcome for society in general and may ironically be extremely positive for the company itself partially because if you know it may lead to it being more adaptable and um, and and robust therefore robust but also part of that will also come uh, potentially from engendering a sense of trust in its workers in, in, its, in the company work, you know, a sense of belonging, like you do of a city. You feel, you may be born in Palo Alto, but presumably you feel a New Yorker to some extent. I mean, you know, and you feel a certain connection with New York and I feel, you know, and so on. And so you feel that. Um, and, and, you know, you want that. Now, there are people that have become company people, of course. But, you know, you want people to have that. I know this sounds a bit flaky in a way, that kind of feel-good feeling that you do about identifying with the city, identifying in that in a sense of pride with the company in that that's sense. Right. That's right. And so that is beginning. I see that happening. And that's a fantastic development if we can engender that and make that flourish.
Very insightful. The, before I get to the last uh, closing comments, uh, any companies, obviously you mentioned the Westminster Bell Company or the brewing company in, in Germany. <laughs> or, uh, I like to think of that's Cologne because I love the beer in Cologne. Yeah. But let's say that that's obviously a narrow path of a, a predictable audience for a long time until it's not. Um, are there companies that you've seen very successfully feed the calories and the scale with longevity? I mean, you mentioned, I think, Airbnb in your book, but other probably others out there that have had that long lifespan, longer than 10 years of a public company. Yeah, well, GE, of course, is a, is a classic case in recent times of, of, uh, of adaptability. And IBM, in a way, well, IBM is a funny case because it actually didn't really die, I mean, in a certain sense. Uh, uh, but it did adapt in the end. It was able to sort of get it, uh, get it lift itself by its bootstraps in a certain sense. There are many companies that have lived for um, well over 100 years, of course, um, yeah, 200, yeah. 300 years that, are, that have adapted in, in various ways. But it's, it's a rare occurrence. I think that's the, the important point is it's a rare occurrence. Um, you know, I mean, it, when you, as I say, our analysis uh, is based on um, all U.S. publicly traded companies from about 1950. Um, and that constitutes um, about 30,000 companies. And uh, most of those are dead. Most of those are gone. You know, yeah. and it's the famous observation that if you look at the uh, Fortune 500, even 50 years ago, there's almost none of them you recognize. I mean, there are companies and names you don't even remember, uh, which is incredible, you know. So, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, but, but there are ones, and I'm afraid I've, I, my, my, my morbid self has focused more on the, the uh, mortality than the longevity <laughs> in terms of examples. So, so Jeffrey, so to close up, um, you know, we're all trying to envision coming out of this period uh, afresh, uh, obviously yeah. safely, but rather than, I say, reassembling the past, we're trying to kind of look towards the future but knowing that human behavior uh, it has some inertia to it, it doesn't always change as fast as we like to think it does. Um, what do you think the human behavior patterns are going to sh- you know, change towards uh, or not uh, coming out of this pandemic in your mind? Well, we've already talked about them earlier on, of course. I do think um, the, the role of this kind of interaction is going to become um, much more, more prominent. As I said, it was already happening, um, and this event is, is like all major events, accelerated it. And so there's, gonna, there's certainly going to be that, I think. Obviously, I have, most of the things I think have already been said, either here or other places, of course, uh, that um, you know, there's going to be more working at home, more remote working. Um, um, on the other hand, having said that, you know, that's not going to be true for the vast majority of people. I mean, um, you know, um, professional uh, people in service industries might be able to do a lot of this. And certainly those that are running companies and that have the, well, the, 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 the kind of resources to do it, that will happen. But this is, you know, um, I hate to say it, but we're talking about the 1% or the 5%. The vast majority will continue to have to live and hopefully enjoy living in an urban environment um, and uh, having to go to a factory, a working place, a salon, whatever. I think that will continue. So I don't think we should get too carried away with those huge changes. I do think, having said that, though, just going back to what I said, the, the, probably the major change is doing what we're doing now. Um, yeah. I don't mean doing lots of podcasts, but I mean, <laughs> and I don't mean also frivolous stuff. I mean, right. that is, that's I think, the important thing. I mean, there's been obviously people who do, we do lots of FaceTime um, with our families and so on and friends and uh, so forth. And serious business will be done yeah. this way. I, I hope that we can, uh, to uh, a sort of inspiration you gave me at the beginning of this uh, discussion, I hope that we can stop the spread of the virus but increase the spread of ideas and impact uh, yes. through this period in a similar way that the pandemic, uh, uh, you know, illustrated. 
but for the right things in life and obviously virtually or physically try to uh, change the world for the better uh, through this flow of information. I hope so. Uh, I think that's the, that's the, uh, the final thing, right? We want to make uh, all this work for everybody and uh, make the world a better place, higher quality and standard of living and get through Correct. things in this terrible period that we're in now. Correct. Well, Professor Wes, I really appreciate your time and your insights, and it's a real treat and pleasure for me to be able to talk to you like this. And uh, I hope we will be able to meet for a glass of wine or a cup of coffee in person. And uh, I would find that energizing uh, to continue the conversation. But thank you for being with us virtually today. Well, thank you, Ari, for having me. I really appreciate it. I enjoyed it very much. And uh, yeah. Uh, and I do look forward to meeting you in person. And so I see you in three dimensions and uh, <laughs> you can <laughs> not stay static like this and two dimensional. I look forward to that because this, I mean, this was an example where it was an excellent conversation. You know, we developed ideas and so on, but it would be even better if we were in the same room together. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to cr create a lion tree, into the durability that a city uh, has to offer. And I'm going to need your help along the way to get as close as I possibly can. I wish you luck and I'd be happy to help. <laughs> Thank so you so take much. Take care and keep well. Thank you. You too. Thanks very much. Yeah. Bye then. Bye. Bye-bye.